Hello everyone, welcome to Field Notes, an exploration of functional medicine. I'm Rob Downey, a family practice MD and Institute for Functional Medicine certified practitioner. I'm coming to you from Seaworthy Functional Medicine in Homer, Alaska. Seaworthy exists to help people overcome their health challenges and be fully vital. Today, we are fortunate to have Deborah Atkinson with us, a fitness expert, and your passion is helping women in perimenopause and menopause with movement and exercise as medicine. Welcome, Deborah. Well, thank you for having me. Yes, it is. I feel really passionate about women in midlife, and here's the deal. So every listener out there, I hope we grab your attention right away. There is no more powerful health influencer than you. <laughs> and this fits with um, the familiarity I've been developing with your message and your content is this uh, engaged. All right, here we go. It does not have to be this way. And may maybe we should start then by just pointing out because as a functional medicine physician, I, I have the poignant experience experience of, of taking care of women who are somewhat fatalistic or stuck uh, in their description of um, how they relate to movement or, or they don't feel a sense of agency around movement. And I think that's where, I think that's where you um, come in. So let me add a little bit about your background. So you've got, um, you're an author, you, so um, women can access your content through books. You've got Flipping 50 as a website, you've got podcasts. So like many luminaries in functional medicine, there's a multifaceted set of ways women can uh, get to this information that you provide. And you've been doing this for a significant period of time. So women who access this content, they're gonna be getting mastery level information about where the yield is. Is that accurate? That's very accurate. So. 36 years, this is number 36. And so I hope you're all gasping, right? Really though, you know, like a lot of trainers and like a lot of, you know, I wore a lot of hats. So I won't say I was, you know, personal training and there wasn't even personal training when I started, right? That wasn't even a term yet. Um, but really the last seven years when I realized I've been working with midlife women since I was 20. And, mm -hmm. and there was a reason for that, that I didn't realize at the moment. But when I realized I kept hearing from my baby boomer clients who were slightly older than I was, nobody gets us. You know, mm -hmm. I've, I've even gone to my doctor and I'm sure not you, but, you know, and heard well, welcome to menopause. You're getting older. Like, what do you expect? And they weren't willing to settle. That didn't quite feel congruent for them. And I realized there's more to this. So I set out actually to serve them. And I never imagined I would stumble onto the solution I did in the way I did. So we can let that unravel <laughs> if you'd like. Yeah, well, it's going to pique our listeners' interest. So, yeah. So let's put that, uh, illuminate that for us next, if you would. Absolutely. So I've been working in the fitness industry, kind of on what I call all sides of the table or the the weight bench, if you will. So I taught in kinesiology at Iowa State University for about fifteen years. Kind of saw students come through in their entry level core classes. And then I got to supervise the same students going out on their internship, the last thing they did. So it was a lot of great closure for me, realizing what they thought they needed to know. And at the time I was working in a private facility also, hiring, training and firing fitness instructors and trainers. And so I knew what I needed them to know. And then all of a sudden I'm 49 and I knew what I wanted them to know if they were going to work with me. And that's a really unique perspective to be able to hmm. see all of it. And, and I thought, you know, I've got to help those trainers understand better. So I quit my job in order to help with marketing and sales to keep the really good trainers with both the, the skills and the knowledge and the heart who were not just marketers, but really could help and wanted to. 
little did I know that my level of stress from quitting just two feet in, you know, saying goodbye to safety and security of our regular paycheck and TIAA CREF fund and all of the good things that happen when you have a job and somebody's paying you just to show up. I was panicked a little bit. And so my stress level really went up. And at 49, although I couldn't say that I was yet experiencing hot flashes or night sweats or symptoms, you know, those changes are happening under the hood or they're going to tomorrow. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and I realized that allowing myself to get away from the computer where I was building this new online business for maybe 20 minutes a day, you know, instead of hours for the last mm. three decades, I was actually more fit. I was stronger. I was leaner. And I was like, wait a minute, this really flies against everything I've ever been taught and everything I've taught. Mm -hmm. So I needed to unpack that a little to see, is that just me? you know, a study of one, is that just a fluke or is there more to this? And what I discovered is that such a small fraction of research on exercise and sports medicine features females at all. But when we look at women going through seven major hormonal changes in their lives, some of us go through more, some of us go through less by choice or by divine intervention, that's the way it has to be but a lot. And each one of them demands a unique exercise prescription. Mm -hmm. then, then if you do the math, 39 divided by seven, we're talking 6% or less of all research if it's evenly distributed, looks at any woman in a phase of her life and tells her, here's how to exercise to perform better or to avoid injury or to feel better. So you know, women who are exercising or can't figure out how to exercise and not getting results, not feeling good. It's not your fault. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 That's uh, well, and it's a reiterative theme in functional medicine that so many of us on the sort of information providing end or the uh, supporting people's agency or participants in functional medicine I think one of those key moments is, oh, as the uh, as I get clear eyed about this, right. I realize there was this sort of drift of circumstances that led to this place. Mm -hmm. uh, and so people not only let go of some self punishing they're often doing, yep. uh, but they're um, rather than having to try to be hopeful, there's a um, more of sort of an instantaneous sense of hope. Uh, just because there's so much clarity then about how they got to where they are, much of the same information about how they got to where they are is about the path forward. Yes, so true. And of course, in the green room, you and I were talking about where where you grew up. Well, I grew up in Iowa. And, you know, in Iowa, you know, there are a lot of things we're famous for, and it's corn, by the way, it's not potatoes, anybody who's wondering. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there's a little confusion about that. But there's also the Iowa State Fair where we do, you know, fried butter on a stick, literally, and that's a thing. And, and anywhere I looked around when I lived in Iowa, I could see people that needed help, that I could help. Well, when I had my little midlife crisis and, you know, was working and a little panicked, I ended up selling my house and having to, that was one of my major stressors, moved to Boulder, Colorado to live with my niece in, in the basement of her house. So this is not something most people see for themselves at 49, just saying, <laughs> um, but suddenly realized as I looked around and I was there for about three months, there are five people maybe here that I could help and I've helped them all. I should probably go back because the mindset, you know, of surrounding yourself with people that you want to be like doing the things you want to do, you know, it's, it's hard. I think when you're in an area where, you know, the mindset that you want and the way you want to feel is not what you see the normal people doing or serving with their habits. And I realized the difference mindsets, you know, and or placebo and expectations can make in the way we age and the, mm -hmm. 
daily choices we we have for as well. Yeah, yeah, and it underscores, I think, that there is a. Uh, uh, during the pandemic, of course, this is all amplified to mind-blowing levels, and we'll want to talk about that today. But uh, pre-pandemic, mm -hmm. uh, many women were already isolated by this due to this multifactorial portrayal of the media, of the, you know, all that sort of uh, garbage around, you know, um, uh, I, you know, ideals of uh, youth for men and women and, you know, diminishment over, uh, over time. Um, what do we want and why do we want it, et cetera. I mean, unfortunately it would take like three days to unpack that, but my point taking care of women would be that um, they're more isolated than they realize sometimes mm -hmm. uh, as they uh, fight their way free of that junk and it's like, where's my peers? Where's my camaraderie? Where's my, my team? And I think that's what you're providing intellectually. And again, via what we discussed at the beginning, which is people can continue on into uh, content and a plan uh, yeah. and, and, and get moving forward. Yeah, so agree. And just back to your point on community, you know, and now the need for connection more than ever, you know, whether whether you lived across the street from me or not, you know, we still were not, we're not connecting in that way right now and probably are not going to for a long time to come. You know, I think mm -hmm. the comfort level, there's some statistics that have been run with surveys to about 10,000 people that show, you know, only about 30% of all gym members prior to pandemic are actually going back right now. Mm -hmm. and so 60 to 70 are still thinking, I'm not going back ever. Yeah. 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 Well, uh, I think that uh, when this is all said and done, all of us will be uh, new in some way or multiple ways, and society will be reimagined in some or multiple ways. So it's like one of these big journeys we're all taking together. And uh, rather than going back to whatever we were in the before times, is one of my. <laughs> team members calls it, you know, the after times is going to reflect a big journey in the interim. Uh, so let's make sure our listeners, and I want to thank our listeners for joining us today. Let's make sure we get some really uh, concrete uh, expertise transmitted to them. Um, mm -hmm. You mentioned in some of the preparatory content you were kind enough to give me that one thing right out of the gate is now people need some um, some advice and insight uh, if they're exercising at home or they don't have access to the gym. Should we segue into that? Absolutely. Absolutely. So women in midlife, particularly, we're vulnerable and we were BC, all right? So before the whole thing started, we were already somewhat vulnerable because in that period of late perimenopause to early years of Postmenopause, so you know, plus or minus that moment in time where you're 12 months from a, a last cycle, we're accelerating our muscle and our bone loss, and we need to be exercising. But beyond that, it goes deeper. We need to be exercising in a very specific way, and that I think is what we need to emphasize that it's not a random YouTube video or a how I feel today workout because most people feel like a pizza and a beer, right? So we really, <laughs> have on that one. yeah, so strength training is really, really important. And I would say that to any woman, anytime, two years ago, 10 years from now, it doesn't matter. And if you want to gift your young girls, your daughters, your nieces, you know, or those you um, find that you care for, you want to gift them with something so that they can age better, get them into the weight room while, mm -hmm. they're, young, while they're young and they're confident because it's a whole lot easier to get started and stay there than if you're foreign, no matter how much of a, a bad ass boss lady you are, you know, <laughs> in the boardroom or running a business or running your home, but if you're a fish out of water with weight training, it, it makes you, you know, feel vulnerable. We don't like doing things we're not good at and you're not going to be good at something you've never done before right out of the gate. So strength training is your best friend. And the reason is we are losing that muscle, but we are also losing bone. So 
one of the things I want to distinguish is that the same kind of strength training that could help your muscle will not necessarily benefit your bone as much. We kind of need to separate them. Mm. So while you can pick up a lighter weight, do more repetitions, and you can reach fatigue that way, or you can lift that heavier weight and do fewer repetitions. It'll take you to reach muscular fatigue. Both of those will help your muscle, increase your lean muscle mass or prevent losses that ultimately will lead to frailty. And most of our motivation really, it, it, it really doesn't matter how old you are. And I'll make that point in a minute with an example from my mother, but, um, most of us are motivated by getting into the clothes in the back of the closet or by something that might be coming up. Nowadays, it's on camera, but otherwise a, a wedding or a reunion or something more immediate. We're not necessarily motivated by what might happen to us 10 years or 20 years down the road when you know we might get sick, we might be frail. So we can think about those things intelligently, but the emotional part that gets you off the couch is probably something else. And to anybody who's feeling like that's kind of vain of me to, it doesn't matter because it's like a bonus. You get the two for one, okay? So mm -hmm. but whatever motivates you, let it motivate you because you're still gonna be healthier because of it. So there you <laughs> go, right? Um, but bone doesn't benefit as much, at least up to a certain point. So if you're coming off the couch and you began doing yoga, you may get some bone benefit from that. But if you're already uh, an active person, you're walking around daily, running errands up and down your stairs, adding yoga to what you're doing potentially is not enough anymore. It's not what we call minimal effective stress. So we need to have that something pushing on the bone in order for it to push back. So <laughs> if you lift a little heavier weights. If you're a woman who is apparently healthy, you, um, you know, have no known osteoporosis or osteopenia, jumping rope and actually doing some things with impact can be very helpful. Not everybody can do that and not everybody should, but everybody should be lifting weights or doing resistance training mm. and reaching fatigue. The magic number is actually a heavy enough weight that you could lift 10 or fewer times and mm. fatigue. So that's pretty heavy. That becomes yeah. a bit more challenging to think about how am I gonna do that at home? safely right yeah. so that's where we need to get creative and i can offer some solutions for that if who knew there was going to be a dumbbell shortage in 2020 right seriously <laughs> right <laughs> because if Amazon's out you know everybody's out right <laughs> yeah but backpacks your body doesn't know what you're lifting, right? So, you know, I came from a small town where, you know, some of the best athletes in our high school class were farmers' sons right, who were lifting bales of hay. And, you know, the same concept applies. So if you are, you know, lifting um, grandchildren, you know, toddlers on a regular basis, if you've got a backpack in the closet and you've got some heavy coffee table books, you can pack that up and, you can lift that, whether you're rowing it or pushing it or putting it on your back, just be a little bit more careful with that. But there's all kinds of solutions and substitutes that you could make. I love that. It's certainly reminding me of some things I've improvised myself over the years. <laughs> when I used to rock climb, then I had a little dowel that I had I cannibalized out of a closet and an old piece of climbing rope that had taken too many lead falls and a milk jug. And then I would roll it up, you know, 10 times one direction and 10 times the other to do yeah. my flexors and extensors in my forearms. And, you know, visitors to my house would ask about the milk jug attached to the dowel by the <laughs> climbing carabiner. <laughs> so, and uh, now, yeah, now we got to get creative again. <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, no matter where you are, I mean, we can all go out a little bit, right? So, you know, heading over to Home Depot or your your home store for sand, you know, bags of sand or mm -hmm. um, heavy things. And I've got a big dog. So occasionally, you know, the dog food bag is full. Mm -hmm. And 
and all of those things work. Yeah. Mm. I should thank you. I should mention for our listeners too, and I'd be curious to hear your take on this. I was looking over a summary the other day from the Institute for Functional Medicine on um, maybe we should talk a little bit about intervals too. Do you think those have a place for Absolutely. women in perimenopause and menopause? So the Absolutely. Institute for Functional Medicine list, you know, shows that nitric oxide, human growth hormone, native production, yeah. um, the uh, brain-derived natriotrophic factor for the brain, miracle grown for the brain, which uh, heals our brain and prevents dementia, you know, on and on, like uh, we'll get a threefold or more, oh, the endorphins, you know, the, the, the native feel-good chemicals, those are like threefold amplified by um, intervals. What should people know about, what should women in perimenopause and menopause know about that? Yeah, absolutely. So all of the research for women in menopause in any phase actually points to, you know, if you're doing a long, slow walk, we're not saying don't do that, but if you're only doing that, I would ditch a couple of them and substitute. So especially for women who are complaining about one of the probably top two complaints outside of hot flashes, belly fat. Right. So whether you have the weight gain or not, often a woman will have belly fat. It's kind of that redistribution of where you are carrying it. But visceral belly fat responds best to high intensity interval training. Mm. And across the board in in all of the research, whether we're talking about strength training, we we talk about two muscular fatigue is really important. So don't just do 10 repetitions and put them down. If you could still do 10 more, you're not done. Mm. Three more, you're not done. And we've gotten conditioned, I think, to just follow along and maybe realize we're not asking ourselves, is that weight heavy enough for me to do some Mm -hmm. good? So it's reaching muscular fatigue for strength and then for high intensity interval training, we need to make this clarification that we've got to get breathless. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times I know that women who start working with me will ask, well, I jog and then I walk. And if you're jogging or calling it jogging, it's probably not high intensity interval training. It's an interval of different levels of exercise, but high intensity interval training is that that helps you have the fat burning potential after the exercise is over. So what I call it is, you know, leaning over and you've got hands on your knees and I needed a break. You got to <laughs> feel like that. And, you know, mm-hmm. you know, 30 seconds or a minute, most of us can do something hard for that mm-hmm. amount of time. You mm-hmm. should feel like you just ran through a finish line and never, ever, ever are you going to look down and say, I wonder what my heart rate is before you cross the finish line. Just go. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Mm, thank you so much. It, it's a good chance to have our listeners hear from an expert uh, about sort of a, a little vignette I'll share um, and, and see if this is kind of accurate or not. So I was a little intimidated by interval training. Um, mm-hmm. And 15 years ago when I was 40, uh, 38, you know, I had a heel fracture so I went without running for a long time and then I got back to running, et cetera. And up here in Alaska, then I was on my bike and running and I thought I'm really missing the intervals here. I'm really missing a big part of the benefit because I'm lucky enough to have the functional medicine education help me as well as my patients. And I also believe in being on the journey with them for all kinds of reasons. Yeah. And so I was really struck that, uh, if I opened the throttle up totally as a 53 year old runner, it felt a little bit like, um, you know, I might pull a hamstring or something like that, but I found I could get breathless at about 85% of the throttle wide open within one to two minutes Mm -hmm. or doing it during the uphill stretches of my trail running or what have you. Like I felt like, Oh yeah, I am, you know, my heart rate is way up there. Like I am breathing really, really hard. I really want this one minute or two minute interval to end. Um, And I was really struck by how much more energy I had just over the next week or two within adding intervals. Even the turnaround time was 
uh, startling. And I've read and heard so many times we're all in the literature, but also in the lay kind of reporting both. There's something about intervals that's kind of the secret sauce, like the payoff to investment is off the chart. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think, you know, for women who are thinking, you know, I'm a little reluctant. I mean, your story is so spot on. And I want to come back to this too. So if anybody's thinking, well, I don't run. So stop your thought process right now, because that's the example that you gave, but you can walk any mode of exercise that you already are doing or enjoy, excuse me, <coughs> tickle in my throat, um, can become an interval. So, I mean, that could be swimming. It could be upright in the water. It could be, um, we do it, we do live in my membership. We do it twice a week. I'm in my living room, no equipment. We're just doing moves in a specific enough way to reach that intensity, many of them low impact. So mm -hmm. you, can, you can walk, you can power walk up a hill. There is a little something to be said for there's more injuries that occur because of speed than because of resistance. So going mm. up the hill actually can be a safer way for some than mm. speed back to your feels a little vulnerable, like in the hamstring. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And mm. that alludes to, if you're going to do intervals, you don't start cold, right? So making sure you progressively warm up. So your body is kind of ready to hit that accelerator. Mm -hmm. That's important. Um, so great points. Hopefully that kind of illustrates. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, so I hope our, our listeners take it away that any type of uh, aerobic movement they love, yeah. when they're nice and warmed up, they yeah. can add three, four, five intervals in a workout, open yeah. the throttle up for one to two minutes and get a lot of benefit unless, are those numbers a little off or is that? No, that was, that was a great example, but it made me um, call on a fairly recent study. It's now within the last year, but a study specifically, and almost all studies that I'm going to talk about take into account, they are on women in perimenopause or postmenopause. So there's a lot of studies that, um, like Tabata came out a long time ago. Everybody will recognize that word. But, you know, I had to raise my eyebrows when, you know, um, you know, everybody was loving it, jumping on the bandwagon. But that study was done on elite cyclists, male cyclists who were working at 110%. That means they were throwing up over a wastebasket between intervals. And none of us wants to do that, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to kind of pull back and say, if it worked for a young man at the peak of his muscle mass, will it work for a woman in midlife, essentially at the peak of fat storage, right? I mean, we have to say, wait, will that work? And, and yet there is, these two words appear all the time in research about women in midlife when it comes to exercise for results, adequate intensity. Hmm. So, yes, although if you're experiencing a lot of fatigue, then low to moderate work is always going to be beneficial. But if you can, you feel good, you're going to get better results going hard as hmm. much as you can safely for your joints. But a study done with postmenopausal women on bicycles. So they were literally on bicycles in a indoor setting where you've got more control. So whether you have a Peloton or you have your bike on a trainer, which is really fairly economical, if you think about it. Um, and the protocol is this eight minutes of a warm up and of a cool down. And in between for 20 minutes solid, they were doing eight second high intensity spinning and then 12 seconds recovery. Mm. So, right. So it goes really, really fast. There are 20 second little cycles for 20 minutes. You cannot be doing your shopping list because you're constantly watching, you know, you're right. <laughs> in the minute. So actually, as much as that may sound like, oh, I like to let my head wander. Actually, if you really want to release some stress and get away, like you went on vacation, this is a better way to work out, to be in the moment and have to be there, not doing the 99 things you were doing, you know, before. They get a twofer because that meets her Benson's criteria for mindfulness also. Exactly. <laughs> so here's what happened after three times a week, doing that for eight weeks, 
the women actually lost significant amounts of fat, but the exciting part is they also gained lean muscle mass, which is, we almost never talk about that when we're talking about some kind of cardiovascular exercise. Mm -hmm. and, and it was significant enough to show that, of course, it was in their legs where they were doing the cycling, but those are great results. And the, the thing to remember here is that's low impact, right? So mm -hmm. the rate of injury is going to be very low. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cycling, elliptical, Nordic track, mm -hmm. lots of good options. Well, um, in the materials you gave us in advance, another thing I thought would be so important to the women who um, tune in today is that um, there are there are um, you know two two dimensions that we should talk about about women's relationship with their hormones. There are hormonal changes that preempt or feel like they get in the way for women of having a good exercise experience, and there are also um, benefits to hormonal balance that come from exercise. Right. So can you comment on those two dimensions for us? Yeah, when the best way to say this is it's going to sound a little like tough love, the reasons or the excuses you're using for not exercising potentially are the reasons you should. So I liken this to 20 years ago, you know, what I might have said to working with somebody who has insomnia. And that was, you cannot wait till you get a good night's sleep to start exercising in the morning. You're going mm -hmm. to start the exercise in order to get a good night's sleep. Mm -hmm. So yes, it's like planting a tree. Had you arrived in menopause already fit, potentially already tolerating a little high intensity exercise, there is some proof that the frequency and the intensity of hot flashes or night sweats is actually lower in those mm -hmm. who arrive more fit. But if you haven't been on that path, it's not too late to start. However, and we do want you to progress, right? So we don't want you to jump in necessarily to high intensity intervals and strength training all at once. Although men and women with um, say chronic emphysema, they're doing interval training. They respond best to it. So mm. you can do interval training. It's just like the old um, cliche is, you know, what you do today for intervals will seem like your warm up later, right? Mm -hmm. So it's just relative. So does mm -hmm. it feel hard to you? Then it's hard. Don't let anybody <laughs> tell you otherwise, right? Always. Mm -hmm. If you feel like you're having a heart attack, you probably are. So let's just listen to that. <laughs> so you can start and start with high intensity exercise. And that just means reaching fatigue, but doing it wisely. And mm. still for, for anyone, you know, I like to take a two week and we do an entry level, whether it's to intervals or it's to strength training. And then we bump that up, provided you've heard the feedback, your body said, I'm okay with that. Maybe aware I wasn't moving those muscles, but I'm not so incapacitated or sore that I'm suffering and then we bump it up. So it may take a couple months to bring you up to a point where you're really feeling like you're doing enough volume. But at that point, then you start to see better results. So that vaso um, restriction in the challenge with the being able to monitor um, your availability of heat and cooling system and getting that going, that's really what you're helping. And that's kind of the mechanism that helps to decrease the hot flashes and night sweats. So you can still start that up. You may find that you trigger a few hot flashes. I've had that happen among clients and mm -hmm. it's not comfortable, but I think if you can work through that, it will improve. Mm -hmm. Sounds like women need uh, some confidence that they can build the plane as they fly it through yeah. perimenopause and menopause. <laughs> Perfect. Well said. <laughs> <laughs> so um, share us some, um, uh, some nuts and bolts things for us, if you would. Uh, uh, presume a woman's listening to this saying, wow, this is so cool. So how do I access these resources? How, how would you recommend that a woman, because again, we're in an age where so much of this is remote or online or on Zoom or what have you. So if a woman's hearing this and they think, well, I want to 
you know, I want to work with Deborah and benefit from this information. Could you give us a little one-on-one -on -one primer on how to clip in and what a woman can expect? Absolutely. So um, easy way for you to get started. And literally, if you're looking for how do I stick my toe in the water and either get started or restarted. And, and there's a kind of a third person I'll talk to. And that's whatever you're doing right now isn't working. It's causing you more fatigue than it's causing you to feel better. Um, I have something called the five day flip. Everything in my world is flipping. So the five day flip is five short videos, literally 15 minutes or less where I'm actually showing you how do you lay out a, a workout week and you've got two strength training, two cardio kind of moderate intervals and even a recovery day in the middle so that you do a little core and um, core is really important to me. I had a back injury when I was very young. So I've had a lot of empathy for those with back issues for 36 years now. So, um, and that's a simple way to get started really being active the you know other place to go would be just simply go to flipping 50 there are blogs if you'd prefer to read there's a podcast and there is a 39 series of flipping 50 tv where i took all of the most common questions by readers and listeners and i created a little tv episode answering that so if it's mm -hmm libido or it's chronic upper back and neck pain if it's i don't know how to exercise because i've got this this degenerative hip and how do i work around that there's probably an episode on that so mm -hmm. a lot of rich content and sounds like women can direct where their questions may be or their stuck points and we uh i i saw in um Again, some information you gave us that in terms of if you had to pick one thing that you think is like the most important message, it's this idea again that exercise is medicine. Mm -hmm. Are there dimensions of that we should talk about that we haven't already? Well, you'll appreciate this. So, you know, if you were giving someone a bottle of medicine, you needed them to take you know, it comes with a certain dose and a certain timing that they take it every day. And you would never, ever, 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 ever say, take that whole bottle today and let's just get it over with. And you would also never, ever, ever say, just, you know, take it every other week and that'll be fine. And quite often we do one of the other, one of those two with exercise. Mm -hmm. We, you know, we can warrior it, you know, thinking, I'm going to punish myself for whatever I did yesterday or get ready to punish myself for what I'm going to do tomorrow mm -hmm. and go for you. And, or we maybe feel like I'm treading water and none of this is working. And, and then we give up and don't do it. So consistency is your best friend, but if, if it's medicine, then there's a dose and a frequency that you've got to take it. Yeah, yeah, I love that. And I, I just resonate so strongly with it. And it it takes me to one other thing that you said today, which is for the person to, um, you know, think about what or how they do something all um, that's a good fit for them. Yeah. And I often encourage people to make sure that they, um, you know, really try to engage their sense of play or joy. Um, and and uh, I one thing I kind of wanted to talk to you about today, I don't know if you see this, but I think it's a related concept. I find this so interesting because I do it and my, my patients do it, but we'll talk about movement as healing and the person will kind of um, diminish it. Kind of like, oh, you know, and the thing I've noticed the most is they'll be like, basically what they're saying is like, well, I've already taken up jogging for a month in my brain and it didn't help. Hmm. <laughs> you know, where it's like, I know that's not gonna make a difference. And, um, 
So what I see as a functional medicine doctor is there's a couple of domains where the yield is just off the chart. It's transformative. So one is whole food. Yeah. If people just switch from the standard American diet, processed food to whole food, yeah. like this deep wellspring gets tapped. And then the other is movement. And I think it is because we're still genetically hunter gatherers. We're built to move. Yeah. And so when people transition from conjecture about movement to striding in the pool with a buoyancy belt, if they've got joint or back problems or walking with a friend or resuming jogging or taking up tennis again or getting on the bike or whatever, when they just do it and just start moving again, most of them are shocked when they talk to me later, like, oh my gosh, there's this freshness. Just, ah, if I had known that was waiting for me, I'd have gotten back to, you know, taking my medicine quicker. Is that a phenomenon you see in the people you help? Oh yeah, so much. You know, I think I, I just read this from someone else today that, you know, it's most people don't realize how good their bodies are designed to feel. And I went to the eye doctor last week and you know that moment when you think you're fine, you don't need new glasses until you put that on and it's like, Oh my gosh, that's what I've been missing. <laughs> you know, and yeah. That's, you know, I think by this point, anybody listening probably has been to an eye doctor and you've had that moment. <laughs> you totally get what I'm saying. But uh, yeah, I, you know, and, and I do think that one of the greatest rewards in doing what I do is literally hearing that back, you know, that I started for weight loss, but I got my life back. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, you know, I feel stronger. That's the name of my program actually is stronger and it's not skinny for, for a purpose, right. For a reason, mm -hmm. but I do feel stronger, but then they'll go on to say, but my inner self, I have more strength in that way, you know, mm -hmm. and that's the real reward because, you know, it's, I hope you become, become codependent, truth be told, right? That will get you hooked because of whatever physical thing you might want. But the real thing that's going to keep you is going to be just something so much deeper that you mm -hmm. will never want to stop. Forming that friendship with exercise. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, that's a beautiful, I think that's a beautiful concept to, to wrap up on. Yeah. So folks can uh, watch this podcast. They can check out your podcast. They'll uh, see a link to your website. And then if they check out the blog, that transcription drops more like three to four weeks, but the blog actually has hyperlinks to everything you referenced. Okay, so that people that really love to drill down, if they read the blog, that'll all be hyperlinked and edited. So uh, what a blast getting to talk with you today. You too. So I have all these images of Alaska. Yeah, well, I'm in archetypal Alaska. So humpback whales, sea otters, wow. brown bears, ocean, snow-capped mountains. The whole nine yards. Lush foliage, like, uh, okay. yeah. Put my name yeah. on a spare bedroom, okay. <laughs> if, uh, you know, we have a hard time getting visitors to uh, come. And so the offer is sincere that, uh, you, friends, family, checking out Homer in the summer is a lot of fun. Picking on a low tide is a neat thing to do. Low time tide, because then you can do some tide pooling and stuff. And uh, oh, cool. there's a lot of fun hiking and joy here, particularly in the summer. The long days are intoxicating. You feel like you get an extra four hours of play. I want to come back to that. So you just mentioned that word again, joy. And you mentioned it a couple minutes ago. So just to, to touch on that without bringing up a brand new point at the end, but you know, that is, there are 10 tenets of flipping 50. And that is number 10, mm. do it for the joy, not for the calories. Mm -hmm. So whatever it is you're starting, make sure you can see yourself doing it for the long run because mm. you're mm. That's great news. That's great news. I've, I've thought that another way to describe functional medicine would be co-emergence of the same truths in multiple domains. And so any of these key principles that surface in multiple domains with multiple thought leaders, it's telling us that probiotics, joy, gut health, uh, knowing that we can be more than, you know, 
we're seeing in the media or the culture, you know, these reiterative themes are are reminding us that there's there's more. Absolutely. And so joy is a good one to close with. And I found joy, uh, deliberate joy in the moment, whether it's uh, hearing my child's voice or being grateful, you know, for my marriage or um, to have a roof over my head or the fresh air or a warm pair of socks out of the dryer. It's really an antidote to some of the stress right now. It's that joy in the moment. Yeah, totally agree. <laughs> that was. <laughs> Well, it's so good of you to give us your time. And uh, I think that this is going to be a great episode. It's so rich in content and it's so rich in specifics that I know that the that the, all everyone who listens, in particular the women who it's so salient to, they're going to take away some things and feel like, oh, this, uh, this thought leader really made a difference in my life and understanding. So again, thank you. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. And, and if they do take away things, then we have been successful. Right, right. Well, have a great rest of your day. Thank you, you too. Seaworthy exists for people to overcome their health challenges and be fully vital. Please consider subscribing, giving us a five-star review if we've earned it, and going to our website podcast tab for any questions or comments you'd like to share with us. Thanks.